All right, it's 1.30, so I say uh, let's go ahead and get started because we've got a, a ton of questions. Um, you know, um, you guys have sent me quite a list of over 100 questions even before we get started. So um, now many of them are on similar topics uh, as we think about those, these issues. And I think that, um, you know, many of us share some of the same questions uh, and issues. So um, as we jump in today, we'll, um, we'll try and think about them. Um, again, um, you know, thanks for hanging out. I know many of you may have joined uh, the webinar that David and I did last week. And because we got so many special ed questions and didn't have time to get to them, we promised we would, uh, or I would do a follow-up session today just to address special education questions. Um, you know, a couple other logistical things. One, um, I've got a ton of questions ahead of time, but please use the chat box. I'm actively monitoring that. So I'll, I'll try and get to all of those questions as well as we go through things here this afternoon. Um, this is information and informative. So um, if you need specific legal advice, always make sure you're asking legal counsel. Um, and uh, if you did miss the webinar on more general staff and student issues that David and I uh, did last week, it is posted um, on our YouTube channel. So if you search for Miller Tracy on YouTube, it's there. Or um, I've linked to it on my Twitter account. So if you go to my Twitter account, um, not too far down, you'll see the, the link to uh, the YouTube video of our webinar we did last week. Um, and um, if I did everything correctly, I'll be recording today so that I can we can post this one as well once we're once we're done. But I say let's jump right in because you guys have asked a ton of questions. Um, I don't promise I have the answers you want um, or great answers to every question, but certainly I think there are a lot of great stuff for us to think about as we we work through them. And the first set of questions, I've tried to kind of put them in an, a logical order because so many of them deal specifically with issues of face masks and face coverings and the requirements related to that. Um, you know, we addressed that with staff and students generally last week, but specifically when we think about our IEP students and the issues that may arise with IEP students in terms of things that may be different. I mean, again, the big picture view is, as things stand right now, it's gonna be required that all people in the school building, teachers, visitors, students, staff, everybody who's inside a school building is gonna to have to be wearing um, a face mask, um, subject to some very limited exceptions. Um, those who are not medically able to tolerate that, um, and then some, you know, obviously while we're eating, we have to be able to remember mask to eat and, and, and certain other activities. But obviously we know when we think about special education, that creates a whole other set of, of um, issues and concerns that we know that immediately come to mind, right? Everything from those students who are gonna be more medically fragile to those students with behaviors who may not be willing to wear it, um, uh, students who are deaf and hard of hearing and, and maybe lip readers or other accommodations that might be necessary, you know, uh, speech language services. There's a whole variety of those. And so I'm just going to go through the questions and think about them out loud. Um, and certainly, again, as you have questions on those, feel free to put that in the chat. And, you know, you have the option there to ask me or everybody else. So if you guys want to, you know, have that conversation as well amongst yourselves, feel free to do that. But you know, the first, the first question is really one of the, the key ones, I think, as we move into thinking about this, and that is, if a parent of an I, a student with an IEP has already said, what if my student refuses to wear the mask, what will the school do? And I think that that's where we have to take a step back and, and think about, you know, many districts, as I've talked to them, have kind of a continuum of how they plan to deal with the mask requirement whether that is more of a teachable moment, uh, whether that is disciplinary, whether that is something in between. Um, I think the bottom line big picture is we, outside of the medical exemption, which I wanna get into and talk about, I've got a lot of questions here about that. Outside of that medical exemption, um, everyone is going to be required to wear a mask or appropriate face covering. Um, and I think that the answer, generally speaking, is for those who aren't, they're required to be excluded. Um, I think it's probably better to consider that a medical 
exclusion, not a disciplinary exclusion for what I'm sure you're all thinking are obvious reasons, particularly for IEP students. If that's a disciplinary exclusion, then we're talking about SB 100, we're talking about manifestation determinations and, and all of those things that go along with it. And so I think as, as I see here today, and again, we know all this could change this afternoon still yet, right? Uh, in terms of uh, what the rules are. But I, I think where I am at today is I'm thinking about that exclusion more like uh, the vaccination and immunization exclusion, right? If students don't have their um, immunization uh, paperwork in by October 15th, then we know we're required to exclude them and that they're not entitled to services. And those things. I, I think that's the better analogy here um, is that this is a, a medical necessity and a health and safety necessity that students are wearing face coverings and therefore those who are excluded we would treat it in that way so i think the answer first of all is generally speaking the answer is they're excluded when we start to get into some iep specific issues right students who have uh, need medical accommodations or have behavior issues i think we need to also be approaching that issue like we all know to do every other issue in special education, which is we're gonna to have to make an individualized determination for that student um, how to best accommodate them. Um, and, I, and again, I think we start with the rule that's gonna to apply to their gen ed peers, which is no mask exclusion, unless we've approved an exception. And then we need to think about how that accommodation is in place. Because when we are talking about, for example, a medical, exclusion it's not one size fits all just like we all know we can never do in special ed is this student need to never wear a mask to only wear a mask for certain periods of time do they need to have certain periods of time where they're not wearing a mask what's the least restrictive way that we can manage that um, i do not think and would not approach this that as you know doctor's note equals no mask card, right? I think this is an individual inquiry. When we get that doctor's note, our obligation is to consider it. And then we think how we make that accommodation work. Because this is a real honest health and safety issue for others. And that student who is not wearing the mask because they are medically unable to, to wear it may be putting other people at risk. Remember, the mask is not about protecting that student, it's about protecting other people from a potentially asymptomatic carrier of COVID-19. And so I think it's very important that we, we recognize that and that that student not wearing a mask is a health and safety risk to others, potentially. And that's where, you know, the self-certification, the symptom checks and how else we accommodate that, right? Because I think the lack of a mask necessarily then has to turn into other considerations. That's a student who's going to have to be more physically distant and socially distant from others. That's a student who may not be able to engage in certain activities. That's a student who may have their seating arrangement different. There are other factors. It's not just gonna be, I got a dog or so, I don't have to wear a mask and I get to go about everything like everybody else does. I think that student who is unable to wear a mask is gonna be more restricted in what they can do and how they have to be distant from others during the school day. So I think that's an important recognition is, is how we, we play that out. So that leads to several other of the very good questions um, that come up, right? Um, you know, what rights do parents have to be notified if students in my child's class are not wearing a mask? Particularly this comes up with students who might be high risk. I think we have to recognize that there's, um, there is an obligation, I think, without violating privacy and even and unnecessarily identifying that student the parent but just like we would tell parents hey you've got a student with a peanut allergy in class therefore no peanuts or hey there's going to be a service animal in class so if you're allergic let's talk about other accommodations your child might need if we've got a student who has the accommodation approved of not being able to or not being required to wear a mask at all times um, then i think there is an obligation because that does put the other children and adults in the classroom at a greater risk. Um, and so we need to make sure then in response to that, 
for those very few limited number of students who are going to actually have that accommodation of not wearing a mask, um, that um, we are then providing for the safety of everyone else in different ways. So I do think parent notification of others is important so that those parents can make an informed decision, particularly for a medically fragile child. You know, if, if I have a child who is medically fragile and there's another student in the class who is exempt from wearing a mask for whatever reason, I wanna know about that because I might make a different decision about sending my child to school. And I think that's really important for us uh, in terms of how that, that plays out. Um, does wearing a mask need to be in the student and staff handbook? At this point, I'd, my view is all of our decisions related to COVID-19 during a declared emergency, et cetera, are emergency procedures and obligations. So I don't think they need to go into our permanent handbook or our permanent policy, but I think we do need to make sure that they are in a manner that are accessible. So that's why signs and, and memos to staff and letters home to parents are important. I don't think those are handbook issues at this point because these are temporary pandemic related measures, but I do think that there does need to be clear communication about those guidelines to parents, students, and staff. Um, if a district is recommending that a face mask be worn, but not requiring it, would the cooperative employee follow the district or cooperative procedure? Well, here's my answer for my co cooperative folks who are out there. If you've got a district that is not following the state guidelines, then I don't think I'm sending an employee into those buildings. Bottom line. Um, I don't think that we're covered under insurance. Um, very possibly if that happens, I think that creates a workers comp nightmare. I think that has other issues. So I think the answer is in that situation, first of all, I'm not sure that that district is gonna be allowed to be open if they're not gonna require face masks. I think that's one issue that's gonna pop up ultimately. But I would say, um, generally speaking, I would not allow my employees um, to go there, nor would I send students from other districts to a district um, who is not requiring people to follow those, um, those state guidelines. Um, the next question here, a parent of a child in early childhood, um, instead of the child has to wear a mask, they're keeping them home. What does this mean for the IEP? And I, I, I don't think this is limited to just early childhood. I think this is a broader question. So if we have, um, you know, a student who is um, opting out, I think we need to look first at how the district is treating that for all students. Because I have certainly heard that as it stands right now, districts have a variety of plans of how to deal with that. Many districts, what I think the most common response is, um, are that districts are creating remote learning options for those families that feel more comfortable in remote learning. Um, that they recognize that they have a significant number of families who are gonna be more comfortable looking at a remote learning situation than going to school for a variety of reasons and that they're making that option available and using the staff who may need to be remote for medical reasons. Um, be responsible for those kiddos. So I, I think that's where most folks are going is that, that they're just creating that remote option. For those who aren't, I think then the issue becomes one of, does that student qualify for homebound instruction? Um, and if not, then we need to have an IEP meeting to talk about how we're gonna serve that student. And it might be something as simple as, then we're at, at the point of sending a stand ready letter, saying, here's the plan, we're ready to implement it, you're choosing not to send your child to school but I would probably make that my last option instead of my first option um, in terms of how that, that plays out. But I think that is something we, we wanna think about. Um, you know, many, many questions on the mask front um, look at questions related to then more of the behavioral side of that. So a student who behaviorally is choosing not to do that, I think we need to think about like every other behavior 
right? And so how do we encourage it and, and, and think about addressing that? For those students who it gets beyond um, a willful behavior, you're talking about a student with a significant cognitive disability who can't tolerate a mask and those kinds of things. Again, we need to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis, make an individualized decision about how we can keep that student and other people safe from that student, um, and then um, you know, determine what individual accommodations are necessary for that student to, to, to help in that. Um, I, I think one of the things that's going to be a really tough conversation we're gonna have to have with some medically fragile and other students is whether they are able to attend you know, at all or whether they need to be remote learning for now. Um, and I do think that that is something that we need to, uh, to keep in mind as, as an option as we look at those on a, on a case by case basis and whether we need to as an IEP team make the decision that that student is unable to be safe at school. You know, that's, that's a tough call that has lots of FAPE implications because that profile of a student is one who is unlikely to as easily benefit from remote learning and, and other factors as others. So I think we need to do what we can to maximize their time at school uh, and how can we work with them to get to the point of being able to wear a face covering. And, and I recognize with some that's just not going to be possible. Um, but I think otherwise for those students who are medically fragile, a lot of them it is gonna be remote learning for them for all or part of this year, whether that is through a, re a blended remote learning program that we're deciding as a district, or for those districts that are gonna be full in person, um, that they may qualify for homebound instruction with a medical certification. You know, I think the question comes up, you know, is it safe to go into the home, especially if we're going into multiple households? I think that creates another series of questions. I mean, certainly the uh, regulations permit that instruction to happen ver via phone and video conference as well. So I, I think we can look for ways that we can do that virtually um, without sending someone in the home and making those case by case determinations about whether we should could you know send someone to the home. I think that is something we would we would actively actively think about. But Several more questions on the mask issue before we get into some of the other questions. Um, you know, providing the child the opportunity to lip read, is that a valid reason to use a face shield instead of a face mask? I think it can and probably is. We need to think about ways that we can do that and when that's necessary and important, or if there are other ways to accommodate that. I mean, I think it's pretty clear right now that face shield and face mask are not interchangeable based upon ISB and IDPH guidance but I think there are times when we're gonna to have to think about specific accommodations for those students who are lip readers or who have other needs that we would want to, um, to look at. Um, what would I recommend is a process or documentation that a student wouldn't be required to wear a, a face mask as a doctor's note required, must an IEP meeting be held? Here's the way I look at that. I look at that as a request for an accommodation like any other. And so a student who is medically unable to sustain a face mask, that is going to be either a 504 situation or an IEP for those kids who already have an IEP. So I think we would look at it like any other IEP accommodation decision where our obligation is to consider it right? Remember, consider it. And so we need to actively be thinking about how we consider that note and then make a decision about the accommodation. Um, and I think that's the process through which I would undertake that. Again, why I think those are going to be rare situations where we're saying yes to that accommodation and that it's not a situation where the doctor's note is a get out of mask free ticket, right? I think it's going to be a decision like every other accommodation, right? If you get a note from a doctor that says the kid needs to go to the bathroom every 20 minutes all day long, what do we do? We consider it. If we get a note from a doctor that says they can't participate in PE, we consider it, right? We make that decision. And I think we need to be very careful um, in, in that regard when we are working through that, that process. Um, and so I think, Again, that's either a, a 504 issue 
uh, or that's an IEP issue and how we handle that. So if you get the note from the gen ed student that says, I'm medically unable to wear a mask, then I would say, here's the process where we start a 504. Um, and if the child doesn't qualify for a 504, then they're wearing a mask. You know, I think that's the way we're going to, to think about it. Um, you know, do we always need a doctor's note? I think the issue is, I would say in most cases, otherwise we're not gonna be able to confirm the existence of the medical condition that makes the accommodation necessary. So, um, you know, I, I think in some cases it can be obvious, right? Where we can, based on upon our own knowledge and observations of the student, know that that accommodation is necessary and that we're going to have to make different accommodations like a student who has significant cognitive disabilities or or other medical conditions that we're already intimately aware of um, i think that that's something where the team can make that decision um, without the need for extensive additional medical documentation um, and so I, I think that's the, the reality but i also want to make sure that we're not just quickly saying you don't have to wear a mask, you don't have to wear a mask, you don't have to wear a mask because kids are getting doctor's notes from you know, some local quack who's got a political ax to grind. So I think those are things we wanna be uh, very careful uh, in terms of how we, we plan that. Um, and then of course, if a student is not gonna be required to because the team decides that accommodation is necessary, then we have to look at other accommodations like physical distancing, not being able to participate in certain activities where physical distancing couldn't be uh, maintained, uh, maybe less mainstreaming opportunities. I mean, there are gonna be some, I think, uh, real medical um, limitations then on that student in the, in the school setting. Um, and we're gonna have to make those on a case by case basis. Um, sensory questions. So a lot of questions here about students with, you know, if, if it's a sensory reason, um, again, I think just like any other, if the doctor's note is the medical basis is sensory, then I think we talk about that as a team, just like we would any other request for an accommodation. And again, I think because of the extreme health and safety need um, for masks to be worn, um, and what I think is abundantly clear at this point, that it's undeniable that that is an essential component to public safety at this point, um, then I think we need to be cautious about when we say yes. And if we do, then what's the sort of domino effect of the additional accommodations that are going to be required to keep that student safe? Um, and whether or not that student can even attend school, right? I think that's important. And I think that the really tough ones where we're going to have to really think more clearly about the need for some more specific and to an extent more strict accommodations are those students like as as, as one of you described here um, the student who is uh, in, has multiple secretions during the day drooling runny nose watery eyes you know those are situations where we're going to have to really think about you know more extensive PPE for staff and distancing and, and, and make a decision on a case by case basis as to whether we think that's a student who can or, or should um, be attending school. So I think that's, that's important for us, especially. Um, another question here is the masks, how, how is that tied to least restrictive environment? So when we've got an LRE issue, so like parents of some students with IEPs who are saying, hey, we wanna, we wanna homeschool uh, because their student won't keep a mask on. Well, I, I think first of all, the homeschool question, that's up to that parent, right? So the parent says, I wanna homeschool, then that's not a student who's gonna be in a, you know, entitled to FAPE. Um, they may or may not get a service plan at this point, um, but otherwise, I, I think the reality is um, the parent who says, no thanks, I'm homeschooling, we send a stands ready letter and that's the end of it. Um, Otherwise, I think it does create an LRE issue, absolutely. And I think that's the analysis that we have to undertake and I think a parent could challenge that. So I think we could say, for example, you're gonna be on remote learning because you're unable to wear a mask. I think that that is a, a real possibility with some students and I think that that may be the right decision in many situations 
And if a parent challenges that through due process, which they would have the right to do, you know, we would have the same LRE analysis about whether there are other supplementary aids and services that could make the student's attendance uh, appropriate. And if the issue is they're too big of a safety risk um, because they're unable to wear a mask or have other issues, then that's something we would actively have to think about uh, in terms of how we, we deal with that student and make decisions in, in that regard. Um, so I think that's particularly important um, as we, we think about those issues. Um, You know, I also think when we get into some other uh, specific questions here about, you know, when we're talking about direct service providers like speech or counseling, where we're, we have to think about appropriate distancing during those services. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, if, for example, during a speech session, we've made the decision that it's going to be face shield for that session. Remember, it's gonna be masks while we're walking to the room and other things, and then we're gonna, you know, during the session, but then that may create a broader requirement for distancing, right? So we have to recognize that, you know, to the extent we have situations that dictate the use of something uh, different, we need to then be, you know, aware um, of the additional accommodations that might have to be in place in terms of distancing and other facts. Um, so I think those are, those are factors that are particularly important. Uh, let me just go through here to see if I had a couple other mask related questions, and then we've got a whole bunch of other questions on other topics, but, um, let me go through a couple more of these mask questions. Um, you know, how handing out consequences again, I, I think I want to really, be careful about viewing this as purely disciplinary. I want to think of it more exclusionary, like a student who doesn't have their immunizations, you know, uh, what we would do with lice, uh, you know, though that's, the, that's probably the more that I want to treat this not as a discipline issue because that has other implications like MDRs. And I'm more willing to think about that as a health or safety protocol that's required for entrance into the building. And I think that's the way I would, I would think about that for sure. Um, so on that behavior front, student refuses to wear a mask. How many times does it occur before the IEP meeting is held to re be revised? You know, I don't think there's a magic number there, but I think at some point we recognize that that student's decisions and behavior is, you know, making it unsafe for them to be at school. And then we would have to look at the possibility of, um, changing that to remote learning and working with the parent in that regard. It creates some difficult stay put issues if the parent were to challenge that change. Um, but at the same time, I think as a health or safety basis, we would have to look at that on the short term. Um, and again, the question here, if the district's policy is to suspend students, I think I, I don't know that I want to call that a disciplinary suspension. I think I want to treat that more like lice for uh, MDR reasons. Okay. Um, so that's just getting started, right? We've spent our first half hour just on, on, on masks. And I know that that's, you know, um, I think the reality is that is that's going to be required and, and that we're going to have to get used to it. I, I, none of us love it. You know, I've attended meetings as some of you have with, with masks. Um, you know, the reality is we're going to get used to them. We're going to have to wear them. And, um, you know, students are going to be resilient and figure it out pretty quick. Uh, you know, I, I can't say, you know, like right now with daycares, they're requiring it and kids are doing it and they're making their best with it. You know, I, I think there's a clear difference between saying, we're, you know, we're requiring it and doing our best and being indifferent to it. And I think we know liability arises in situations where we are deliberately indifferent or have a disregard for safety. And so I don't think, you know, the student who takes it off for a second while they're sitting there and thinking about a problem and gets prompted to put it back on, 
that's not the, you know, that that's going to happen. And, and I don't know that that's an, um, a risk that goes beyond anything we would, we would tolerate. And I think the practicality of that will, will manage and uh, the situation and, and speak for itself. But what we have to be, I think, vigilant against as anything that looks like a, a conscious disregard for safety or being indifferent to those those requirements. And I think that's that's a factor we would we would think about. A really good question um, here on the mask issue that I think is kind of a good way to to wrap up that question then to get to some of the other topics and, and IEP related questions that you all have asked. If a student has a doctor's note, um, but we have to have an IEP meeting to consider the doctor's note for an accommodation, what does the student do in the interim? Well, I mean, I think that's where I'm communicating with um, families as soon as I can to try and get those things taken care of before school starts to say your child is going to be required to wear a face mask and if you believe an accommodation is necessary then here's who you contact to schedule an IEP meeting to talk about that um, but I, I think the issue there is if the student is unable to do so I think what we have to do is have them making attempts to wear that um, until they're able to or until that meeting's able to take place. And so I think we need to do our best to have that meeting before school starts so that that decision can be made um, or possibly in some situations made through an IEP amendment if there's agreement uh, about that. Um, but otherwise, I, I, you know, I don't like the option of excluding the student from school until that can be held, particularly if the delay of that is on the district. Um, but I do think we have to make steps to make sure that the student is wearing one to the extent practicable until that meeting can, can happen or that they're remote learning uh, until that happens. I, I mean, I think that's the reality. Just like we would exclude a student for, like I said, not having immunizations or I, I don't think that we're, you know, not educating them during that time, but I think they're remote learning until that can that meeting can be held, but I want to make sure that we're not creating the, the delay uh, in terms of that. Um, question here, I've, I've had a public therapeutic day school already state they are not going to make their students wear masks. Um, I provide related service providers to that program. This seems like a situation where I don't send staff in person unless things change. I agree. I would not send my staff into that building if they are not going to comply. I just, I think that has to be the answer right now. Um, and when the districts say, we're going to get sued because our kids aren't getting related service, then I'd go back to that school and say, then you better step up to the plate and get on board with this mask thing because otherwise um, that's going to be an issue for, for students and, and, and how that, that plays out. All right, so now we've got a whole bunch of variety of other questions. So I'm just gonna start going through them so that we can, we can do that. Um, so here's, I think, a really big picture important one, which is, is there a requirement to amend the IEP or okay just to develop a remote or blended learning plan? Well, I don't think those are mutually exclusive. I think those are saying the same thing. I think what we are creating is a remote or blended learning plan that gets attached to the IEP, but we know we can only create that through an IDEA sanctioned process. And there are only two ways the IDEA says we can make decisions, right, that are individualized and with meaningful parental participation. It's either through an IEP meeting or what we call the IEP amendment process. I mean, the regulations don't actually use that term. They say, entering into a written agreement with a parent to make changes to the IEP without holding a meeting. That's what an IEP amendment is. We, we shortcut that an IEP amendment. So that's, um, we're, an IEP amendment doesn't necessarily mean amending the IEP, right? It means we are agreeing to changes without conducting a meeting. And so I think that the answer is to those, yes, we are doing both. We are developing a remote or blended learning plan for the student, either through an IEP meeting or a written agreement with a parent to modify the IEP without conducting a meeting, which we in short term or in, we shortcut and call that an IEP amendment, right? That's, those are the only two processes through which those decisions can be made. And anybody who's not making those decisions, those processes is subjecting themselves to a real risk of, of due process um, and procedural 
uh, procedural violation. Um, all right, next question here. Um, am I aware if press is gonna be issuing any recommended policies? I don't think so, uh, in part because I don't know that for these specific short-term emergency issues that are probably gonna change on a monthly or quarterly basis, you know, having permanent changes to policy is the, the right approach, and I would doubt press would do that. I think instead, these are temporary procedures that are being administratively adopted um, based upon state guidance rather than a permanent change to, to policy. And so our advice has been, I don't want a local policy because that makes it look like it was the local decision to do these things, and it's not. Um, I think it helps absolve you from liability and all sorts of other things to be able to point back to the state and say this was the state's decision. Um, and so to that end, what we've recommended is taking the state's, you know, like parent one pager and those things and make sure you're getting it out to parents. Um, I don't think it needs to come from us. I think it needs to come from the state, but we need to get it to them. And so I, I think that's that's what I would recommend and what we've been recommending as part of that process. Um, you know, in terms of the remote learning plans that were put in place uh, last year, you know, I, I think the issue is whether we need to make changes to them now or later depends upon whether or not they continue to be appropriate. Um, I think there are a couple important points, I think about our individual remote learning plans that we all created last spring compared to this fall. One, you know, for any remote learning this fall, we're now going to have a clock hour requirement from the state, the five o'clock hours that we didn't have. So I'm not sure that those plans on their face meet those expectations. The other concern I have about the plans from the spring, I think we all did those so fast, right? And so I think it's hard for anybody to criticize those plans because we did them so fast. Um, almost overnight before we knew what we were doing um, and really did our best. And I think that was a, a heroic effort by districts to make that work. And so because of that, I think that districts are given a lot of grace um, in any challenge potentially to those plans from the spring. I think as this goes forward, there's gonna be a little less grace uh, in terms of, um, you know, how those those things play out and so I want to make sure that those plans are a little bit more more specific um, you know I I think the only the only way to do that in a way that's compliant with the IDEA is having a an individualized plan for that student because we know that the IDEA doesn't permit us to make one size fits all decisions and that we have to make sure every decision is made through a process that gets that meaningful parental participation. And so I, I don't know how any process other than that is compliant with the IDEA or survive some of the challenges we've already seen filed um, where we haven't done that. Um, you know, somebody's commented here that the state has told people not to create those plans. That's the opposite of what they told me. I've had conversations with the same folks who said they agreed that the answer is to create individualized remote learning plans. Um, I know that, um, you know, when you look at both the state and federal guidance, um, they make clear the key is that these decisions have to be individualized and through an IDEA sanctioned process. So, um, you know, and I, I don't, I, again, I, I don't, I don't wanna go in and change the IEP itself. I'm not changing the minutes and service page of the IEP because that needs to be remain intact for in-person learning. But I think the only way you do it otherwise is to say on remote learning days, here are the services that this student is going to get. Uh, and anything other than that, I don't think is an IDEA sanctioned process that I think leaves you very much open to procedural and substantive challenges. And I would be very concerned about um, a process different than that where we say take it or leave it, that is not okay. Um, you know, and, 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 a, and a process that doesn't account for those plans. It still has to be FAPE. 
Um, and I, and I think that's where, when we look at, um, the need for an individual remote learning plan next school year might be very different from last school year, right? Because last school year we were really providing, frankly, a pretty minimal level of surface during remote learning for most students. You know, when you looked at sort of those minimum and maximum times that was in the SB guidance and those things, you know, that's a far cry from now saying we've got to have at least five clock hours. And so my assumption or guess is that, you know, some of the statements are, are from ISB more recently is because of that five clock hour, we may not need to change to the IEP, right? It may be that we are better to just implement the plan, the IEP as it is, but do so remotely. And so it, it might very well be that you know, because of that five clock hour requirement, your need to create an individual remote learning plan is very different because you're now more likely to be just implementing the IEP remotely um, than something that was, you know, certainly less, less than that. And so that's the only thing I can think of as to where that might be coming from is recognizing that with a five clock hour requirement for remote learning, um, and the encouragement that that be direct service, um, that there, it, it, it may very well be that we're no longer uh, talking about something that's very different from the student's regular IEP uh, anyway. Um, but I think related to that, and I've had several questions come up here, um, districts who are looking at a, a shortened schedule, like dismissing at one o'clock or two o'clock, how do we handle IEP minutes for that? And I think that's where I have to come back and say, if we are not implementing the IEP as written, then we're gonna to have to come back and, and figure out you know, what that remote learning plan looks like for that student if it's something other than the full school day. Hmm. All right, several people have asked about things like physical restraint, hand over hand guidance um, and other things related to um, you know those situations where we wouldn't be physically distanced and, and I think a couple big picture things for me particularly like on restraint uh, and those types of, of situations um, you know I, I think the first important recognition is that the purpose of physical restraint is to keep students and staff safe. And so what we want to, what we're going to have to balance is in a given moment where a student is an imminent risk of serious physical harm to themselves or others, is that, does that risk outweigh the potential risk of not being socially distant or physically distant? Um, and I think to the extent people are wearing masks and other, you know, uh, PPE, you know, then I think that that that's there. And so I, I don't think there's anything that prohibits us from using restraint or <clears throat> other physical cueing that may be necessary. But then we need to account for that with PPE, hand washing and limiting the, the contact and, and making sure that masks are available, especially for staff in those situations. I think those are things that are going to be um, really important for us. Um, interesting question here. Some facilities are saying they will require students to have a written medical clearance to attend in the fall. Is that legal? I think private facilities have a little more leeway because they get to say who they accept and reject. So I don't know that I can sit here and say that it's on its face not legal. Um, it does have some legal complications to it. Um, and there's a right way and wrong way to do that. Um, and may affect also potentially their ISB recognition and approval. So I think those are factors to, to think about. But, you know, all, those private facilities have a lot more leeway to be able to say no to applicants and, and, and kick students out if they don't meet their, um, their requirements. I think as a public school districts, we don't necessarily have the same 
ability to say that. And so, uh, you know, I've had people say, we want parents sign waivers if they're going to send their kids back to school. I'm, I'm real, um, really hesitant about the idea of asking a parent to sign a liability waiver to send their kids to school. I'm not sure it's enforceable. I'm not sure it's legal. Uh, and I'm not sure it actually helps us in the long run. Um, and so I don't know that we can um, ask for a waiver like that. Um, I think that we can always look at the possibility of needing particular information. I mean, if we believe a student is a, a risk and we want to ask for a doctor's note and recognize the legal implications if a parent says no or doesn't consent to that, you know, I, I think that's okay. So I think that's within our scope of being able to ask for. Um, and I do think we need to be actively thinking about, particularly as the question notes, medically fragile children who are attending our, our programs. If there's something we need to know to keep them safe, we need to know that. I don't know that the medical clearance, so to speak, really changes the liability threshold other than we need to make sure we're having active conversations with parents about how we, how we deal with that. Um, oh, the 70-30 rule uh, and other inclusion things. We're considering half days and half the students coming in the morning and the afternoon, which reduce the class of our sizes and 70-30 becomes difficult. How do, I know there's um, a process to waiver, but that they're struggling to keep up with these. I think that's right. When you look at ISBE's guidance, what they, they've said is all of those rules like the 70-30 rule uh, are fully in effect. Um, and you can seek a deviation and waiver on that. Um, and I think if that's the reality, I would get the paperwork filed knowing they're probably going to be behind in processing those, but I would probably still file the paperwork to get that in place. Um, so I think that's, that's, uh, that's an important one. Um, some other questions here that are, uh, you know, important. We've got so many here also in the chat box I want to get to. So, you know, here as we have 15 or 20 minutes left, I want to make sure to get to as many of these as I can. Um, when we're talking about, you know, OT, PT, uh, multiple students being seen by therapists at the same time, and many of them have a one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, how do we socially distance while treating the students? Well, I think the issue is we have to socially distance to the extent that that's practical or feasible with other PPP in mind. So wearing masks helps us be able to provide that, but we want to think about, you know, how we limit that contact. You know, close contact is defined by IDPH as within being within six feet for 15 minutes or more. So we want to limit, you know, that and, and make sure that we're, we're moving appropriately and that we're not unnecessarily uh, getting things in, in order. So I think that's that's an important piece for us when we think about that. Um, I think one of the tough questions that many of you have asked, you know, the issue is, you know, the ISBE guidance um, asks us to really try and limit mixing groups of students so that we don't have students who are unnecessarily uh, being exposed to too many other students that we're keeping groups together to the extent we can. At the same time, we look at the ISB guidance and recognizing our obligations of the IDEA for IEP students, we're still going to have to meet our, our mainstreaming obligations and provide those, those services. And so we're going to have to have some active conversations about how those work. I, I think the default answer has to be they have to work as close as they can to the way we would have before. And so um, we're not going to be able to prevent you know, IEP students from pushing in and, and things like that. At the same time, you know, we need to look at ways in which we can limit the impact of that. And so if we can have it be always the same kids in the same group, and, you know, so we need to prioritize scheduling in that way. But I do recognize there are going to be times where we're going to have itinerant folks and others pushing in and having, um, having to deal with that as we, we think about those those issues during those sessions. You know, we do need to think about gloves and other PPP appropriately in some of those situations where we're gonna have that close contact. Um, but again, I, I think we need to be reasonable in thinking about that because what we're learning more and more is, 
the hand washing and the sanitizing of the surfaces is important and necessary, but it's the airborne piece to it that's much more um, contagious. And, and, and that's why the, the masks are the, the key to making that work. Um, toilet training. I've had several people ask questions about toilet training. I think that that does create a higher risk situation. So we are going to have to think about um, all of the, the PPE and, and, and limiting the scope of how many people and, and you know, all the, the appropriate washing and sanitizing needs to happen. But I don't think we get to say, no, we aren't going to, we aren't going to do that. Would I recommend districts create remote learning plans depending on the phase? So should we have a phase three plan, a phase four plan? Um, and then that's just, that's there. I think that makes sense to me. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I would hope that we're not going back to phase three, although that is certainly possible. Um, so I think those are factors that are there, but I don't, you know, I know that's creating a lot of work up front, but it might save you some work on the back end my hope is that we're not changing phases. And so I would decide whether that work on the front end is something that's really, um, really necessary. Um, so I think that is, that's key. Um, In-person CPI training, as of right now, unless and until ISBE tells us otherwise, um, the, um, the hands-on CPI training is still gonna be required and we're gonna have to do it with masks and gloves and limit that contact to the extent we can. Um, but at this point, I think that's something that's gonna be something we're gonna have to do. Um, so I think that's the key. Um, next question, any direction on uh, evaluations um, and how that, if we go back to, fully remote learning. At this point, there's not. I mean, I think the issue is if we go back to phase three, um, they did permit evaluations upon a change in phase three. The first part of phase three, they said no, and then they changed their mind on that. So um, we don't have an answer now if we were to go back to fully remote as to what would be permitted uh, in that regard. Uh, several questions about IEP meetings. So right now, we can have meetings up to 50 people. I've been to some big IEP meetings, but I don't think I've ever been to an IEP meeting with 50 people. I've been there with 30 some people, but I haven't been there with, uh, with 50 people um, at this point. But, uh, but I do think, you know, at this point, we, we have the ability to have in-person meetings so long as we can, everybody's wearing a mask and promoting social distancing. And so I know I've been in a lot of your conference rooms for meetings and they don't, allow us to socially distance very well. So we have to think about that reality. But the regulations have always permitted remote participation. And I think right now ISB is still encouraging that. So while we're permitted to have in-person IEP meetings, um, we certainly also can have them remotely with parent agreement at this point because we're in phase four. So if the parent or certain others need to participate remotely with parent agreement, that is certainly um, permissible uh, in that regard. Uh, all right, some other uh, related questions. Staff evaluation requirements, did anything change? Um, at this point, no, nothing has changed. It's still our obligation to conduct those. There are some changes in the rules as to um, if we're unable to complete them due to the pandemic, um, you know, at the end of last year, what the default rating is for certain people. Um, with the change in the school code in, in that regard in terms of the default rating. But as we stand here right now, the requirement to do personnel evaluations remains in effect. Um, when we are, I, I mean, I, I think to go back to the broader remote learning question, I think what the ISBE guidance has been very clear with remote learning, given both the special ed specific guidance that came out from the state board plus the five clock hour requirement that's gonna be in effect um, is it was very clear that we can't ignore certain goal areas. So 
social emotional goals, transition goals still have to be addressed. Uh, we have to find out how we can best do that remotely if that's the case. Um, and that really becomes back to being an IEP team decision. So I recognize some of those things like behavior goals become hard to measure remotely. Um, and ISBE's answer is we can't ignore those goals and we have to find a way to address them remotely. I don't know that there's a good way to do that. So my view is we, we can't ignore it. We have to look at it. Um, and then to the extent it's appropriate, measure that. But I don't know that we have, um, you know, great measurements for, for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to the chat box here because um, there's several great questions here. Um, if we shorten the attendance day to the five hour mandatory length, um, how imperative is how imperative is it that we amend those IEPs prior to the start of the school year? Well, you know, the problem is for each day we're not providing the services in the IEP is a day a parent can ask for compensatory services. So that's the reality. So if we're slow to amend, okay. It just means we might owe some compensatory service for that period of time where the IEP says a different number of minutes that we weren't able to provide. Um, Let's see here, I'm just scrolling through here to see if there are a couple of these questions that I haven't um, had a chance to specifically um, address. Um, should we be requesting right out of the gate that any child who can't wear a mask needs to show up on day one with a doctor's note? I don't want to wait till day one for the doctor's note. I want all of those conversations before day one. So I want people saying, if you think your child may need the accommodation of a mask, then we need to deal with that before school starts. So I don't want a student showing up on day one with a doctor's note and, and no mask. Um, I want to deal with that ahead of time and be communicating with families about that. Um, you know, I think, again, going back to all of the staff issues, a lot, again, if you want to watch the webinar David and I did last Thursday, um, it's posted on my Twitter, it's posted to our YouTube channel. Um, we really address those staff issues. But if a staff member can't safely be at school, um, then we would have to think about how we accommodate them and whether they can rem work remotely or, or what leave options are available to them. So, Oh, here's a great question. If a parent choose remote learning, but they want their remote learning to be in the evening due to their work schedule, do we have to accommodate that? I would say no. I would say we have, I, the regulations say homebound for, just going back to that, it's supposed to be during the regular school day to the extent practical anyway. I don't think the parents get to dictate the schedule of that because if the student's home during the day, then the student can do their remote learning during the day. Um... Yeah, I think we've got a lot of creative options how we're going to use staff, um, particularly for those who need to be remote. And so there's a lot of issues there. Um, and I, I think we may have situations where we're talking about deviations on the 70-30 rule or the age uh, limit rules, but we need to make sure that we've at least filed that paperwork with ISBE for those, um, those changes. Um, make sure we're sanitizing things between sessions, you know, like... Um, shields between speech sessions or equipment between OTPT sessions. That's very important. Um, so can we allow parents to choose remote or in person? Can we set a time span for that like the nine weeks? Yeah, I, I think you can. And I know, I think a lot of districts are doing that and then we'll revisit that. So um, maybe that's on a quarterly basis or some other basis. So I, I think you certainly can, can 
do that. And I think that's what a lot of people were doing because as they've surveyed their communities, they realize a lot of parents who aren't ready to send their kids back to school yet. Um, and that's, so because they have a significant number of those, they're creating remote learning options for them. Um, <clears throat> So if a student has to stay home due to uh, testing positive or exposure, you know, how do we plan for that remote learning? We, you know, I, I think to the extent we have a remote learning plan in place for that student, then we would just implement it if and when that time comes. Otherwise, I think you would put that plan in place at that time um, where you would, you know, work with the family to figure out what that plan would be um, at that time. Ah, uh, yes. So the self-certification, temperature checks, symptom checks, and those sorts of things. Um, does it have to be done every day? It does. As Bia said, it can't be a one-time, we promise, if we send our kid to school, it means they don't have it, that it must be done daily. Um, and so that does have to be daily based upon ISBE's current guidance. Uh, I say current because I know there's been some requests to ask them to clarify that process because I don't know that it's super clear. And then there are a lot of practical considerations, probably why you're asking the question, in being able to accomplish that uh, daily. But at this point, that is their, their answer. Uh, who determines what's appropriate PPE for staff when handling student self-care issues like toileting, et cetera? Um, I mean, that's ultimately a district decision to make sure you're putting that stuff in place. So I would be you know, collaborating with those employees who are on the front lines because we want them to be comfortable. Um, but ultimately, we need to make sure that we're providing that, that equipment to them. Um, if an employee calls in sick and gets a test, do these days count towards the emergency days? Um, yeah, those can, those, while you're awaiting the results, those can be the emergency sick leave that runs prior to their, their normal sick leave. Um, on early intervention, the two-year-old kiddos who aren't required to wear a mask, can we evaluate them? I, I think the answer is yes, you can. Um, at this point, that's the rules. I, I mean, I think we, can, we need to think about distancing and everything else. Um, as someone with a two-year-old, um, you know, she doesn't have to wear a mask. Sometimes she wants to and does wear it at school, they say. Um, she's got one because um, the teachers are wearing it. And so she thinks that's cool to be like them because um, that's her number one thing. She wants to be her teacher. She plays school. She plays teacher. And because the teacher's wearing a mask, she wants to wear a mask whenever she's playing teacher at home. So, you know, I, I think with the two year olds at this point, they're not mandated. Um, but once they turn three, they're going to have to. And so we need to think about how we're preparing them for that eventuality. That is, that's important. Um, for cooperatives, when we've got the self-certification at the cooperative level or pass on to the districts, should they certify each place? M my view is if the employer is the cooperative, we want to do that. And the local district is gonna require that for anybody who's there. I think to avoid them having to do it twice, I think we can reach an agreement with those districts that so long as they certify to the cooperative, we will share that information with the districts if necessary. Um, I think that probably makes the most sense to me. Um, am I aware of many districts who are giving parents the option to choose remote learning if they are just afraid to send their child in person? Yes, I've had many districts say that that's something they are considering as an option, um, just because they have a number of parents for a variety of reasons not ready to send their kids to school. So I've had several, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say most, but I would say many. I think that's a fair way to say that. I have had uh, many students to do that. Do we need to worry about confidentiality if we live stream lessons? Um, I would say generally, based on the, the federal guidance, generally the answer is no for whole class instruction. That um, Department of Education has said for those students, you know, just like it's not a proper violation for the student to be sitting in class and observing each other, that that is true for uh, virtual instruction. And just like a parent can observe their child in class without that violating FERPA, the same would be true of a parent uh, observing the 
you know, a virtual class where there might be other, other students in the group. I think it does become more of a concern when we're talking about, you know, counseling, social work, things that might get more confidential or individual sessions. That's where I think confidentiality does become uh, more of a consideration in that particular scenario. Um, do we need a deviation uh, for remote classes since students will not be in the room together? I think yes, because that's still a class. Um, unless and until ISBE says differently, a remote class is still a class. Um, so the class size requirements where we have to have a para once you get over a certain number of students, et cetera, um, is it based upon the number present in the room if we have a hybrid schedule? I think with a hybrid schedule, because you're, you're not having those students there at the same time. So if you've only got four students there at a time because of a hybrid schedule, I think that, that certainly mitigates the need for the, the paraprofessional as of the class size issue. But if you've got it on the IEP, be careful about not having them there as part of the uh, meeting the IEP. So for that student who has a hard time keeping the mask on, and the example said we've got a student who even has a hard time keeping her current helmet on, other issues, does she have to be in a classroom by herself or do we have to give her a remote learning option? Um, I think we have to consider those things. I think we have to look at what, you know, the, the ability of that student to be, then be socially distant from others um, and other factors that come into play on a case-by-case -case basis. So I would say we would have to consider remote um, and consider distancing issues within the classroom with that student um, if they're unable to uh, keep a mask on and, and wear the mask. Um, what legal roles can classroom aides uh, play during remote learning or class instruction? They can always supplement, they, but they can't be in charge of instruction itself. So they're doing uh, enrichment, supplement instruction, some extra help, but they can't replace the teacher in terms of instruction. Um, so some questions here about our county health department stated, I'm just gonna end there. Until and unless IDPH and ISB says otherwise, those are the rules we have to follow. Now I think a county health department can be more restrictive than the state, but I don't think your county health department saying kids don't have to wear a mask in certain situations trumps the state. The state is what sets those rules as part of the governor's executive order. And so I am um, I am not gonna be less restrictive than the state based upon my local health department, but there may be situations where we have to be more restrictive than the state based on our local health department. If we hear through the grapevine that an employee is tested positive but hasn't told us yet, what should we do? Um, I would reach out to them um, and have a conversation. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that's, that's an inquiry that is job related and business necessity that would be permitted under the ADA. And I think we need to ask because they have to daily self certify. Um, and I think that's the case. Now, the issue is right now, I'm not going to do that, but a school gets closer and that's going on, you know, that becomes an issue because they're going to be required to self quarantine, um, based upon that. Um, we have worked on a template for self-certification. Um, it's also a little bit moving target is we're waiting for the state to say, finally and officially, this is it, but we've got a, a working draft that we've used for that. So I'm happy to share that if anybody asks for it. Um, and if we go to remote learning, are we required to provide lunches? Well, I mean, I think we'll wait and see what ISBE says about that. I think the expectation will probably be yes. Um, I think that would be something that's more um, pickup rather than delivery, if that's the issue. But if we are go back to remote learning, I would expect it would look like we did before in that regard. So I would have that expectation. Um, I think that is that is the case. <clears throat> okay. Well, we've gone over an hour, and I think I've gone through all of the questions. Oh, we've got a couple more popping up here. Um, do we need to write down the student's temperature each time or just check um, that it's okay? Um, 
I think we can just say, is it greater than 100.4, yes or no? And if it's no, you've, you've met that requirement. I don't know that we really need to, I mean, it's not wrong to do that, but I would be okay with that. Um, for staff who ha we know have underlying conditions, severely immune compromised, um, but they're gonna show up anyway, bless their heart. We, I know exactly what kind of employees you're talking about. We love them, but we also worry about them. Can we ask for a fit for duty? Again, I think any time that we um, believe that somebody is at a, a, a threat of safety to themselves or others, or to the, consent, to the con, uh, extent that it is job related and consistent with business necessity, we can require um, that medical inquiry. So we, we can do that, I think, if we've got a good faith belief in, in that situation. Um, but I'd be having active conversations with them you know, about their, their status and, and understanding the risk associated with it and talking about those accommodations, including the ability for them to potentially work remotely or the leave that's available to them, um, you know, under the federal plans as well. So I think those are some important, some important factors for us. All right. Well, that was a ton of information here in just over an hour. Um, you know, I, I have some additional thoughts here. I just, I want to share in closing. And, and I think there are a couple of one, which is you guys are rock stars. You know, you are doing the most with the less, especially the special ed piece to things. You know, it's so frustrating to me that the special ed piece is sort of the last thing on the state's mind when we know that these are the students who are potentially most at risk academically, behaviorally, medically, um, and legally puts the district at the most at risk because of the responsibility to be providing FAPE. Um, and so I know the hard work everyone's doing to plan um, and I applaud you all for that. And I just think it's so important that as we think about these decisions, we remember health and safety first, and then we have to then get into what are those fundamental principles always of the IDEA, which is individualized decisions with a focus on FAPE for this student, design a program that works for this student, and the requirement that parents be a meaningful participant in those decisions. So it can't just be a one size fits all, take it or leave it. Now, parents have the right to opt out. Parents have the right to say, I don't want services. Parents have the right to revoke consent. You know, the regs give them those unilateral rights, unilateral rights to say no, but we have to make sure that we're doing what we can to that. And so that's what's really important for me as we make these plans and as sometimes you're helping remind your principals and superintendents to keep in line with what we need to do for our, our you know, IEP kids and, and those students with disabilities that are going to present some unique challenges, you know, um, you know, we're going to have to make some case by case exceptions and exemptions, but, but don't get away from what we always remember. Individualized decisions, meaningful parental participation, and during this time, health and safety first. And remember our motto, Semper Gumby, always flexible. So thanks for your guys' questions. Thanks for hanging out today. Hopefully that helps us think about so many of these issues that are out there. I, I know I moved really fast through that because I wanted to get to, you know, all the questions that you guys submitted and I, I appreciate that. Um, I did record today. So our intention is to, to post this. So if you want to then be able to share that with others in your, your district or your cooperative, you know, feel free to, to do that. So we'll, we have as soon as we can. I hope it's later today, but I can't, I can't promise that. But I uh, hope everyone's having a great summer and um, we'll talk to you all soon. So thank you so much.